Great. Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, the main purpose of my, my visit here was to get to know you a little better and look for potential collaborations. Um, I have a real diversity of interests. I, I have a background in, in climate physics, but I also um, had an undergraduate degree in economics and, and uh, I'm a commercial pilot and I have a passion for aviation. So Alaska has been a great place for me to be these last uh, eight years. Um, but I, I'm looking to grow my program and, and looking for new collaborators. So that was my motivation for coming. So please, if you have questions, you're welcome to interrupt me during the talk. This was just to sort of tell you a little bit about work I've done and, and uh, some points for discussion potentially. So I've called it uh, climate, water, and energy observation and, and valuation. And uh, some of the things I want to touch on here are human dimensions of climate, but also physical infrastructure, uh, climate sensitivity, uh, really human sensitivity to climate, impacts of climate change and variability, a little bit about differing market settings and how that uh, determines impacts, and then some recent slides from um, some collaborators at uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab who are doing some work on snow monitoring in California. So this is a, an older picture of some of the um, uh, hydropower infrastructure from uh, South Central and Southeast Alaska. I find it actually pretty hard to track down maps of, of infrastructure uh, from AEA and other organizations. But uh, most of you are probably aware that uh, we have a, a variety of, of hydropower projects in the state, many of them uh, rather small, but um, the Bradley Lake project um, sort of medium size, and then of course the proposed Susitna um, dam project. Here's a map of, of some of the uh, infrastructure in southeast Alaska, and the existing transmission lines as of a few years ago are in solid black, and some proposed uh, uh, extensions, and then some of these have been completed. Uh, the Gustavus um, inner tie was completed a, a couple years ago. Um, so if you look at this, uh, this environment is obviously a challenging place to try to run a, a, a energy grid. Um, it's a fewer type uh, physical geography and, and long distances between very small communities. But if you look at the, the, uh, the infrastructure in, in Norway, um, this isn't as detailed a map, but you have a lot of this similar type coastal uh, communities in, in Norway and, and similar challenges in terms of linking those in a, in a grid. This grid looks more like a, um, a straight shot, but then you do have some complexities and of course some international uh, inner ties with uh, Sweden and Finland and, and Denmark. And Is the difference between the red and the yellow the, the capacity of the links? I'm actually not sure. I'd have okay. to look that up. Um, it may be the, uh, I think it's the country who's managing that network. So that you have, you have international ties um, where they're trading power back and forth, but I think um, the red is managed by uh, Sweden and, and orange by Norway. Um, so I'm going to uh, refer back to this kind of physical infrastructure too when I think about um, sensitivity. So I did a, um, I've done a couple studies now. This is one from the SICA study where uh, this, this project's, uh, I think, been completed now, but uh, a few years ago, as they were planning the uh, uh, Blue and Green Lake Dam project down in, in Sitka, um, this, this system has been rolled out in, in phases. So initially, they dammed uh, Blue Lake, and the solid purple line here is the, uh, uh, the, the installed capacity uh, during a, um, a high precipitation year, and the uh, the, the dashed line here is capacity during what they measured to be a, a, low, a low rainfall year. And then the actual load is in, is in blue. So you can see they um, dammed Blue Lake and, and very quickly uh, due to, um, I think, the paper mill and some other local industry, uh, that, that load um, was exceeded right away. And they went ahead and uh, dammed Green Lake and, and then added some upgrades during the, uh, the 90s, but it was clear that um, at some point 
they wanted to continue to expand the system and add another turbine uh, to Blue Lake. Um, and so then the, the capacity, uh, at the, the total system would then be this, this red line. Um, or this is, the, this is the projected load and the capacity with the third turbine would be this purple line here. But even in a, a low, uh, even in an average precipitation year, you can see that there's, uh, that the, the installed capacity is not much greater than the projected load. Uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons that uh, they propose another site um, nearby at Tackett Slate to install another reservoir uh, or, or dam uh, to create another reservoir. Um, but one of the interesting uh, points here is that, you know, what is driving this historical low, of course, and then how do they come up with this uh, projection? And there have been uh, local policies, uh, not just for industrial development, but also encouraging local folks to uh, convert to electric heat in their homes. And that's been one of the things that has driven, <laughs> driven up the load. Um, and, and going to, my husband's actually from Sitka, and going and talking to folks there, um, based on the price of uh, electricity and the availability of it, um, people will have all three sources of heat in their home. They'll have diesel, they'll have electric, and, and a wood stove in some cases, and they just use what's cheapest. But there's an example where, okay, you're trying to balance infrastructure, but then there's, there's local policies at play too. Here's a figure from a paper I had um, uh, looking at the Norwegian system where um, looking over time at the energy production in Norway and Sweden, um, the blue line here is the hydropower uh, production in, in Norway. And uh, in Sweden, it's, the, it's the, the black line here. And while Norway historically depended about 95% on uh, hydropower, Sweden has been more 50-50 nuclear hydro. And so when you look at the total production in Sweden, that's the red line, and that's nuclear plus uh, hydro. Um, you can see that uh, nuclear came online in Sweden in the 70s. And then uh, if you look at these, these trends, that um, they have the ability to kind of you know, fire up more nuclear when there's less hydro available. So Sweden has this option of trading off between those two sources, but then the countries also trade, trade uh, physical power across the grid. So that um, adds some complexity. And then a, another complexity is that in the 90s, there was a trend towards uh, deregulation. These were essentially uh, state-owned companies. And uh, in, in, in both Norway and Sweden, but Norway in particular, um, there was a policy for trying to get it more uh, market-driven uh, costs and, and rates for electricity. So um, they are each other's biggest uh, trade partners for physical power. And of course, uh, like all power, I, I worked on a, um, a weather derivatives desk uh, between undergrad and graduate school in, in New York. And um, of course, there's products, uh, derivatives that are sold on all these different time scales for, for power, which are um, some more flexible than others, depending on how quickly they are um, sold. So of course, when we talk about hydropower infrastructure, we're talking about physical infrastructure that has a very long timeline. So uh, for example, this is from the IPCC report, the last one. Um, a facility or infrastructure that were, was built in 2000 would have the following uh, expected lifespan. So a dam, uh, of course, is expected lifespan of, of 60 years or more. And when you look at the projected temperature anomalies that are associated with climate change, uh, those, those start to be uh, larger as you, the uncertainty is larger, of course, once you get out these 60 years um, of the expected lifespan. So that's why, particularly with hydropower, we care about some of these uncertainties with regards to climate. Nuclear power comparison. Do you have any idea? Um, well, based on the facilities that are built in the 70s, a lot of you know, most of those are still operating. Um, I think, of course, one of the big questions with nuclear is the treatment of the waste, and those are. So, yeah. 
Um, and then, of course, there's changes in, in um, how much people like nuclear based on whether they had a recent accident or they think they're going to have an accident or what happened in Japan. So nuclear is, of course, the favor goes up and down. Um, so in general, um, for Alaska, at least, the, the long-term climate change projections look generally good for hydropower. So when we think about the water cycle and climate change, we think about um, these different categories of the water cycle. We think about is precipitation going to be increasing? Uh, blue indicates increasing, and, and yes, in the great in the in the far north because of the um, increased temperature gradient between the poles, we anticipate more uh, moist air will make its way to Alaska. Um, but uh, soil temperature is anticipated to dry, and of course, um, we start to uh, add in the complexity of permafrost, which is generally not in, in many climate models, at least not this generation, um, then thinking about how that affects runoff and evaporation and then the, the net um, availability of surface water um, is, a, is an open question. Um, not only do these, these models not have permafrost feedbacks that affect how much water storage happens on the surface, but they also don't include uh, a lot of glacier feedbacks, which in places like uh, Southeast Alaska and even in the um, proposed uh, Susitna drainages um, is, is a factor. Also thinking about snow, which of course affects the timing of, of the availability of water. So even though we think that uh, the north is gonna be more moist, we also know it's gonna be warmer. And so you can think about how that it would affect the, um, the snow cover. Um, in, in this model, this was a, a simulation from one of the Canadian climate models. Um, they looked at the uh, kind of delta um, change in snow covered pixels, uh, I think, you know, end of century um, time span. And it looked like the lower, the, the southern part of the state is going to have less snow and that the northern part of the state is probably going to have more snow because of that, that temperature affecting the phase that precipitation falls in. So that's, that's interesting to think about the timing. Uh, snow is a great storage vehicle for, for uh, hydropower. It um, doesn't cost anything, but uh, knowing you need the power when when you um, when you need it when the demand is high. So that's an interesting question. So when we started to look at um, in southeast Alaska, uh, NOAA's National Marine Fisheries approached us. They have a a mandate to uh, regulate hydropower, and uh, and so they wanted to know the impact of uh, climate variability in in uh, the the Sitka facility and, and, and other facilities in, in southeast Alaska. So we just started looking at what is the historical record at climate stations um, in southeast Alaska look like. And so this is these are temperature trends kind of broken down um, by uh, uh, season. And so average temperature trends um, for winter are up top and spring and autumn and summer over here. And in winter, when you look at climate change, winter is always where you see the strongest trends. And I've just plotted the, uh, the, the short-term trend in red here since kind of mid-century. Um, and then the longer-term uh, trend is much, much lower since, of course, we started, a lot of the climate records in the state started in a cooler, um, sorry, no, in a warmer period, and then it cooled off. And, and so you see trends differed based on when you start your, your record and start looking. But we do see some significant trends of warming in southeast Alaska, uh, particularly in winter, which again, for a, a warm place, too, affects the uh, partitioning of precipitation between snow and rain and, and whether it's stored or not. <coughs> For precipitation, uh, the, the trends are much weaker. Um, maybe a little bit more precipitation for winter, but uh, by and large, uh, precipitation is a highly variable uh, phenomena. And so um, any kind of long-term signals really get washed out in, in the noise. And, and I also have a field of my research that has to do with how poorly we measure precipitation particularly snowfall, and that's a, another huge challenge. <clears throat> 
and another reason that we have a hard time detecting trends. <coughs> Curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, are records kept of, um, I, I mean, I imagine that these translate in part into sort of total river flow. And so I'm curious for certain rivers are streams are there can you find time series that correspond to sort of total flow through Susitna or the yeah. river or yeah. things like that? Yeah. So in the state um, the USGS has the longest consistent records. Um, and and so for uh, Southeast Alaska I'll show I'll show a couple of those in a minute here. So, um, so those were some very localized stations. We also think about these large-scale modes of variability for climate. Uh, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is one that gets um, talked about. It's got a pretty big impact on Alaska, and that has to do with uh, sea surface temperature anomalies that uh, are set up by um, interactions with, with the atmosphere. And, and so we define, um, there's several ways to define an index for the PDO, but um, it's basically a, a measure of the strength of the, the temperature gradient across the Pacific from the um, tropics to the extratropics here. And then you can determine a time series from that. And so um, the, the PDO gets its name from that time series, basically has power on the order of about a decade. And so uh, it, has, it has memory, the, the phase tends to get um, stuck in a, in a phase for a decade or so, and then that means that that decade is um, warmer if it's a positive PDO or cooler if it's a negative. And it doesn't explain all of the variance of temperature, but um, you know, a good 60% a good of it here in the state. Um, El Nino is uh, maybe not as famous as it used to be, but it, it has a similar pattern of variability, but on a shorter time scale of about two to four years. Um, and so the impact of, um, of El Nino, for example, on the air temperature in Southeast Alaska stations, um, I picked uh, Juneau, Ketchikan, and Sitka, all who have hydropower facilities. And then I've, I've broken up the, the historical um, average temperature, we call the climatology, by month. Uh, and I've split <coughs> those between El Nino's, La Nina's, and then kind of new average, overall average conditions. So for example, in Juneau, um, the difference between these three type of events is that, um, that it's considerably warmer in Juneau during uh, the, the winter uh, during an El Nino. And the same is true in Ketchikan and Sitka. Um, and winter is when it has the, the, the biggest effect, um, kind of starting in November, December, January. So we know that uh, short-term climate variability has a, a somewhat predictable impact on these sites then. Uh, you could do the same thing for uh, precipitation. This seems to have uh, one of the biggest impacts kind of in the, um, both the spring and the fall in terms of the, the spread between um, these stations, at least at uh, Sitka. And then uh, for uh, Ketchikan, you see a, a relatively big spread. Um, they're both showing drier conditions during El Nino <coughs> events and wetter conditions during uh, La Nina events. So we have a little bit of um, predictability power. Um, you could do the same with snow depth there. And then there is this whole industry of folks doing um, climate prediction on seasonal time scales. And uh, NOAA's uh, Climate Prediction Center issues uh, seasonal predictions. Um, this is from my uh, alma mater, Columbia, does these. And it's, it's a spaghetti diagram. Um, but what it shows is that uh, at each month, there are forecasts that are um, done out for the next month, two months, three months down the road. Um, and these are these are all the different climate models. They're dynamical models and statistical models that are uh, run to forecast this El Nino phenomena. And they, it, there's certainly some variability, but they seem to converge as to whether um, an event is, uh, is, is an a El Nino or a La Nina. 
Um, and this is based on uh, sea surface conditions in the tropical Pacific. So that's good. We have a phenomena that seems to explain uh, some of the uh, climate anomalies in uh, southeast Alaska. And we also have the ability to predict that with um, season ahead type time scales. Uh, there's also a study out of University of Washington that um, took a more regional approach to looking at how if you have a um, El Nino event um, as well as a uh, Arctic oscillation is another one of these large scale modes of variability. If you um, put those two events together in particular patterns, you get other forms of, of predictability in terms of uh, precipitation um, when you when you combine um, those effects. So these are called teleconnections in the atmosphere and ocean. And um, when you set up uh, pressure gradients in the atmosphere and, and uh, uh, temperature gradients on the um, sea surface, that affects the overall patterns of convection. And if you have things going on in, in the Atlantic and the Pacific, um, depending on how they, um, you know, the different permutations of how they kind of fit together and affect predictability of, of temperature and precip. Could, could you go back to that and just explain that a little bit more with the, the, the difference between the Arctic Oscillation not being there and then being in there? Right, okay. So in the, um, this is a, a little bit of a complex um, picture, but it's, it's when you have the event of a El Nino, so a warm, um, a warm event in the uh, Pacific plus a uh, cool event in the Atlantic, and then you subtract the instance when you have a um, the opposite, a, a, a cool event in the Pacific, uh, but also a cool event in the Atlantic, and then here's kind of the uh, the when you have Arctic oscillation positive events, which are generally uh, warmer in the in the northern um, states. And I've got a picture, the next picture is of um, what's going on in the, in the Atlantic. But uh, so the difference between those events uh, shows up as this pretty strong precipitation uh, anomaly in southeast and south central Alaska. Um, so, so you would potentially attribute that to basically this El Nino pattern. The idea is that it's a stronger anomaly on the Arctic oscillation. Yeah. 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 That's that's one way of looking at it. It's a little bit of a complex phenomenon there. So so I don't know if this makes any more sense, but here's sort of a physical description of what happens during the Arctic oscillation in the Atlantic, which is also the North Atlantic Oscillation is its close cousin. And there's a lot of information on this diagram, but we're showing here in, in these things are um, differences in the pressure gradient. So how much mass is in the atmosphere sitting on the ocean here in the North Atlantic. And then you have um, the temperature anomalies. Um, surface stations are shown uh, on land, and you have um, ocean stations that are part of a um, atmosphere um, model, but uh, during a, a positive NAO event or AO event, uh, you have a, a warm anomaly uh, in, in both the eastern US and in northern Europe. Um, and you have the opposite anomaly in, in the maritime states of Canada in southern Europe. Um, so a lot of folks have written about the impacts of, of the NAO or the AO. Um, and it does seem to, to correspond strongly with um, sea surface temperature, with uh, surface air temperature, and again, this, this big pressure gradient. Uh, for much of the 90s uh, and early 2000s, there was a strong upward gradient or upward trend in, in this um, pattern, which folks had um, described as maybe this is the way in which climate change is manifesting itself by uh, getting stuck in this um, strong, strong pressure gradient that's it's driving um, uh, storm tracks and, uh, and, and surface temperature anomalies. Mm -hmm. that, that theory didn't seem to really um, hold because it um, really came back to our more neutral phase in the early 2000s and now has been both up and up and down. But it does, 
it is a phenomena that has um, limited predictability, <clears throat> unlike El Nino, um, but it does have, it, the index itself explains a very large portion of the variance for, for temperature. Um, so in, for example, in Scandinavia, where I was showing you something about the, uh, the power infrastructure, um, if we take a, uh, a product for precipitation and temperature um, and take its um, first mode of variability using an a EOF analysis or principal component analysis, we see that um, the first mode of variability in the precip um, shows up something like this. And so a lot of the precip associated with the, the North Atlantic Oscillation, um, during a strong NAO event, you're going to get an anomalous amount of precip in Norway. Um, and what I have over here, that the time series that I have, the NAO index is shown in, um, in, in yellow, and the precipitation time series from uh, Bergen is shown here in, in red. Um, I also got uh, reservoir level data from Norsk Hydro, and um, I uh, de-seasonalized that and then also put this on the, um, on the NAO index. Uh, the temperature anomaly, though, has a different spatial pattern. It doesn't just affect Norway, but all of Scandinavia um, associated with the NAO. And so the temperature anomaly um, from Bergen is, is shown there. So just going back to a little bit about the market setting for these um, different countries in this kind of case study. So I came up with this hokey cartoon for supply and demand curves that have to do with, with weather. And uh, so in the case of um, Norway and, and uh, well, primarily Norway, you have an event where um, Norway depends entirely on hydropower for their, for their power, essentially. And so the supply curve, I've made a rain cloud here. And, and then their demand is highly uh, correlated with, um, with temperature. And so in the event of a, um, a, a negative NAO phase in, in Europe, uh, it, it, gets, um, it, it gets colder. And so the demand curve uh, shifts out, and the price uh, and quantity demanded shift up. And then um, because of the impact on precip and how much um, was uh, stored during the winter as, as, um, as snow, when you have a, a cold NAO, a very cold winter, you also have a very dry winter. And so your supply curve shifts, shifts in. And again, your increased price um, is going to be sustained through the summer because of the lag effect of that snow storage. And so you'd expect that you would see a pretty strong impact on the, the price for, for hydropower sustained for a good six months after a negative. One, one minor technical thing. Is, is the supply, I mean, my, my naive reaction would have been to draw the supply curve nearly vertical it, with the assumption that in hydro that you, you can't produce more with I mean, you're sort of limited by the amount of water you mm -hmm, have, or something. Mm -hmm. So, so the supply curve isn't price responsive, which would that would, and so I'm just so I'm not I'm not the interpretation would still be the same, but I would have thought it would be a more supply un, unresponsive supply to to price. Yeah, the quantity doesn't change much. Right. It changes the right. price. Yeah, and that that may be true. The, the, the wrench in the argument is that there's also um, international trade happening. Okay. So, um, so here, and I don't want to go through all of this, but again, I've had the NAO index showing um, in, in yellow, and I have data going back to the 50s, and I can show how um, the stream flow data that I got from Norse Hydro, uh, once it's been, um, I've just calculated the, uh, the anomaly, is very closely linked to the NAO. The reservoir levels for when I have the, the data are also um, highly correlated. The uh, production anomalies um, from the industry data are, are uh, correlated. And then the, the precip anomalies are as well. So I'm just curious. We have sort of a similar situation in Hydro Quebec in the northeast mm -hmm. of the US. Which with the North Atlantic Oscillation. And I was wondering if 
Yeah. You have colder winter in the northeast, and then you have less precipitation in, yeah. in Quebec. You get the same thing. Is that what? There, there definitely is a, a supply curve. You can bring on more power, but it costs you. Right. Yeah, and I, I was interested in that and did contact Hydro-Quebec when I was back living in New York, but my advisor was Quebecois, so he decided that it was going to be his his project, and I don't, I don't know if it ever went anywhere. So. <laughs> so that's kind of on the supply side of things. Um, the demand side wait, wait, of Just go back to that previous one. What, what this all says is that... Um, am I correct? What this says is that there's definitely a a very different relationship between this North Atlantic Oscillation or NAO and hydro production. Right. That's that's am I is that the correct interpretation? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but on the there's also a connection on the demand side. Uh, because of this effect on the temperature. So when it's really cold, not just that it, it affects people in their homes, but it also affects the cost of, of doing industry that's temperature sensitive. So did you, uh, did you get, since it's a derivatives market, I'm wondering if you uh, could make some money off this, if you know more about this than the rest Just of the wait. <laughs> You're getting to my punchline. OK, so. <laughs> um, so the, uh, what the deregulation that happened in the 90s that I mentioned led to the establishment of a derivatives market called Nordpool. And so I was able, um, so, it, so in addition to a derivatives market, uh, they also have this physical power, physical trade market. And so um, in, this, in this figure here, um, just from the 90s, I've shown export um, from Norway in black and uh, import to Norway um, in red. And that's primarily from, from Sweden, but some contributions from Denmark and Finland as well. Um, so you can see that uh, during this, this highly negative event in, in 96 um, led to a, a, quite a bit of, um, of, of energy being imported to Norway. Um, the problem is they had already um, written contracts to deliver the power to, to Sweden. And so what they had to do was buy back that power on the spot market, which is very expensive. And so here are the spot market prices um, on Nordpool. And you can see in that, that year, we had um, a very low NAO. It was cold, it was dry, and, and into the summer, um, they didn't have enough power. Uh, the price for power got really expensive. And then you could calculate you know, the amount um, traded and its value then in, in, in dollars. So I was curious, that exact reason, you know, could you use the NAO index to predict the, the price of power on that spot market? And I came up with just a really simple linear model. Um, and again, NEO index is in yellow. And the um, energy spot price, the actual, is in black. Um, the predicted using just the NAO um, in index is in uh, red. You generally don't know the value of that index until the end of the winter, since the winter is kind of the most sensitive period. And so um, the the dotted red line is basically a hindcast once I know what the NAO index is. But basically, um, um, the red uh, with just the NAO index kind of falls apart these two years. But I'm also just training it on events that have already happened. So the, the model isn't very knowledgeable in these years, and it gets more knowledgeable in these years as you have time pass. and. Um, you start to get some pretty good skill for predicting that um, spot price just from this ocean atmosphere index. So, Did you extend that for the next decade? I haven't. I published that in um, 2004. So I haven't gone yeah. back and done it. Follow up on what I was saying. Don't bother yeah. to publish it. Just, yeah. <laughs> just extend the, yeah, yeah. 10 years more. I'm maybe. focusing on the ice classic right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My husband has cheating. this very elaborate model. <laughs> 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 And uh, here's what you can do when you kind of train that um, uh, covariance matrix in different ways. But uh, then there are, of course, lags in the system. And so also in this paper, I, I looked at um, 
lag correlations on the supply and demand side and, and price because the impact doesn't always happen right away depending on um, physical and also mar market lags. So, um, but here's another kind of punchline. So then I went back to the um, the uh, industry data that was published. And so right here I have um, the NAO index is in uh, red and uh, uh, these are kroner, million kroner on the, the left hand side here. And then the different variables, total operating income, operating expenses, profits, and dividends. If you look at what this was, was essentially a crisis event, um, very cold and dry. Um, the industry took in more income. They had a lot more expenses because of having to buy that expensive power. Uh, the profits were actually up a little bit, and of course, um, their dividends were just fine. So they just passed the cost of the event on to their consumers, just like we do here in America. So more of the socialist approach. So some pretty big differences between uh, Norway and Alaska are that um, in Norway, uh, almost all the climate variability is explained by that one phenomenon, that Arctic Oscillation. Whereas climate variability in, in southeast Alaska and south central Alaska is more complex. So you have a, there are multiple modes of variability that are occurring on top of one another. Uh, however, uh, the El Nino driven variability in, Al in Alaska is predictable on a scale that's actually pretty meaningful for management, the season ahead scale. Whereas um, the predictability of the Arctic Oscillation is still relatively poor. So, even though it doesn't explain all of the variance in climate, I think it's still an opportunity to provide information for stakeholders. Some pretty big economic differences, of course. Norway is still a quasi-run, uh, internationally connected grid. Um, Southeast Alaska is, is largely isolated. There are not really the incentives to tap into the Canadian grid, because they have as much power as they need. Um, and the facilities in Southeast are, are run by small municipalities um, and, and not an obvious external market. Um, a lot of these communities, uh, as far as I've been able to tell, are also saddled with a fair, fair level of debt service for having built their facility, um, which isn't really the case in Norway. It's pretty much absorbed by the, the federal economy. Norway's hydropower risk is commoditized um, on this, this uh, market, uh, derivatives market, whereas Southeast Alaska is not, um, but maybe the rate payers are the ones who lose anyway, I don't know. Um, but one thing that interests me as a physical scientist is in Norway, um, they basically monitor every last snowflake that falls in the mountains. They know exactly where that snow is and when it's going to melt. Um, whereas in Southeast, uh, they don't have any tools for monitoring snowpack. Uh, in the U.S., it's the um, the uh, NRCS is the agency that is in charge of monitoring uh, snow conditions for water supply and these kind of things. And they, they basically have a single um, sensor in, in Juno. It's paid for by the municipality. And they do almost nothing else in, in all of Southeast Alaska. So one of my projects has been trying to come up with affordable tools for them to use in terms of information management. Have you done any comparisons with BC Hydro, which is? similar in some ways to what you described for Norway in terms of state run and big scale and highly uh, a major a major supplier for a large population and tied in with international treats. To the extent that I got a PhD student from Victoria who had worked for BC Hydro and she's finishing up her PhD but she hasn't focused on um, she's focused on snow modeling here in Alaska for her time here but they have very uh, BC Hydro paid a lot of money to have climate impact studies done for their area, and they do. They don't do as much monitoring as um, Norway does. Uh, the population is just so sparse, but it's it's certainly better than what we have here. Do any of their models for the Northwest Coast or do they cover Southeast Alaska, or can they be easily extrapolated because it's very close? Well, it is close geographically, but it's climatically different because of the mountains that pass between them. Um, it sets up a nonlinearity in the way that precip, even in southeast Alaska, just between the communities, there's all these microclimates. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so yeah i think it would take some effort we also have um things like uh you know international data sharing for water discharge is uh something i was just at the interagency hydrology committee meeting and, and we're talking about trying to share data with canada across our borders and it's a huge challenge so um so a couple other points I wanted to make is just the fact that uh, regional market integration makes a difference for the kind of economic impact that you measure. Um, so if we do get a system in Susitna, depending on how that's integrated physically, um, will we'll make a difference on, on you know, the price that we all pay. Um, and then climate mechanisms also matter, especially the potential for tipping points, such as changes in glacier distribution and uh, also, you know, permafrost isn't a huge factor in, in, in the southern part of Alaska, but it is a nonlinearity um, in the system that, that has an impact on subsurface storage of water and, and discharge. Um, but I think that the tools already exist to improve risk management considerably, um, prediction and observation. Um, I think for satellite uh, observation, that's another interest of mine. I think there's a lot of... Um, a lot of opportunities to improve that. Um, just the last couple of slides here. Um, so some colleagues of mine down at um, JPL have built a uh, airborne snow observatory. Of course, this combines my two favorite things, flying and snow. So I'm very interested. Um, and what the, the motivation um, is the, the system in the Sierras, which supplies, of course, water for um, a lot of, uh, of the West. And so this particular reservoir that they focus, or uh, uh, catchment that they focused on has several reservoirs. And, and one of the systems of interest is this um, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Was that Cherry? Cherry, was that named after you? No. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> um, so the way it works, so they're using um, LIDAR, which if you're not familiar is a, is a laser technology where basically they send out, um, so it's an active pulse of, of energy that, that goes down to the ground and gets returned to the plane and it measures um, the time it took and the distance. And so um, we use that to do very accurate maps of um, terrain. And so you need to do that uh, during no snow conditions and then come back and do it during snow condition, um, snow on conditions and then take the difference. And this actually works probably pretty well when you have very deep snow packs. Um, I think in places like the North Slope where there are people actively doing that and North Slope is a science project, you have 20 centimeters of snow and, and so your errors start to add up pretty fast there. Um, but, but basically they want to see, could they use the system to um, predict how much snow is, is available? And that would, the, the map then would look something like this. So the airplane has to fly back and forth like this to, to take those surveys. And it, yeah. You know that UAF is active with the UAD, UAS program. Mm -hmm. Are they getting involved in these studies? Um, no, the, the, the two main challenges for um, unmanned system technologies at the moment are just um, your inability to fly over land um, due to the FAA regulations. And then the uh, UAS group at UAF, um, they primarily use uh, very uh, short range uh, platforms like quadcopters have a um, battery life of about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. so. It really limits your applications, but I think, um, as, a, as a commercial pilot, my my thing is let's use real aircraft. We have plenty of them sitting around, and uh, you want to be able to cover a large area quickly and inexpensively, and uh, I think you can do that with a plane. And so here's the real um, final result. So what you're seeing here are the um, the inflows predicted into that Hetch Hetchy Reservoir um, this last spring. And um, the, let's see, the, the actual inflow forecast is the, the blue. And then the, um, the forecast are, are these two lines here. And then right here, that's when the plane flew and they got that update with the uh, LIDAR data. And, and so then henceforth, uh, the actual was down here, while the forecast that didn't have that update from the plane was up here. 
and the forecast that did was down here. Well, it turns out that that was $3.9 million. They didn't have to spill out of their reservoir because they knew it was going to be down here and not up there. So that's huge. That's where you can really say, OK, we can quantify exactly the value of that observation. And that is cool. When you can do that in science and say, OK, we have measurable value on, on the impact of our work, I think that's really powerful. So I would love to get to that point in Alaska for a variety of applications, um, snow information for um, water resources being one of them. Uh, but I, I need help from economists and, and people who know where uh, the, the data are that are relevant for doing that. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to come down here today. So I'll leave you with that question. What is the value of monitoring in Alaska? Um, you know, we can estimate the costs from remote sensing, from satellites and aircraft and drones and on the ground and sending grad students out and local observers and all those things. But um, can we measure the benefit? So I think I'll leave it with that. I think I've got um, another project that, that you all might be interested in. Um, where I worked in a uh, community, um, Tetlin, uh, with a, a linguist um, where, uh, and, an, and an elder there, where we recorded um, stories having to do with water and environmental change. Um, and, uh, and, and then um, tracked sort of the storytelling over time and, and the role of water in, in the language. Um, so if anyone wants to ask me about that later, I can leave a link to the, I, actually I can put it up here. Um, but I don't, that's so different than what I'm doing. The rest of what I talked about. The, so under the uh, Alaska Native Knowledge Network, if you search on the Athabascan language, uh, waterways, language, culture, and the environment in Alaska's Upper Tanana, that's where, the, that's where that film is. But I welcome your questions on the uh, hydropower work. Good on. First, let me try to summarize, to, I'm interested in whether I'm summarizing correctly the very broad point of what you're saying. And the very broad point is that both, both weather in the short run and climate in the long run have significant interactions with the economy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is in many mechanisms. You've talked about hydropower, but Perhaps the most prominent is agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and um, secondly, uh, we have already, and there's the potential to improve our ability, we have the ability to, more so than in the past, to predict weather and climate. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the ability to do that has real economic value, mm -hmm. significant economic, economic value in in these variety of applications, um, and um, and so there's an opportunity which you're you're interested in exploring to uh, sort of focus on those areas where mm -hmm. improving that understanding of either what's what's the what's the um, snow melt going to be, mm -hmm. or what's the rainfall going to be, or or so on. Uh, if by observing we can predict that better, either through ocean indexes or, or more immediate measures like snowpack, mm -hmm. then there's cool things we can do. Yeah. And I'll just mention one little anecdote. I, I my field is studying the fishing industry, mm -hmm. and I was quite stunned actually about a year ago to attend a fisheries economics meeting where these guys from Norway presented a paper where they could predict some enormous fraction of the variation in the price of salmon by the water temperature, mm -hmm. which basically had to do with how, how fast farm fish grew in their in their fish farm pens in Norway, mm -hmm. which just totally, totally drove the supply. So I'm, well, this is, an, and, and then drove the price. And it was, it was just a, a very dramatic correlation. And I suppose the same thing is done in agriculture also mm -hmm. um, around, around the world. But, um, Maybe it's because so much of the world supply of salmon comes from Norway that it's just the temp water temperature drove the price of salmon. Yeah. Which is a, a sort of stunning thing. Mm -hmm. So again, that's another place you can make money. Is 
by yeah. if you can predict the water temperature <laughs> in advance, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and there have been folks who've done historical studies where they've gone into, you know, Viking literature and, and historical agriculture records and looked for, um, you can take this index and, and run it back for hundreds of years through proxies with paleoclimate data and things. And there's a whole field of historical climate variability analysis. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. This is very interesting. I was concerned thinking about monitoring. I mean, we have a lot, quite a bit of, of snowpack monitoring on the Kenai Peninsula. And then, of course, uh, Pileas Resort, mm -hmm. uh, which incidentally actually has some kind of a, there's some competition about snowpack there. You can probably work with okay. that one too. But, but uh, you know, it's, of course, the, variate, the local variation is enormous. More than you know, than you find in Southeast Alaska, even because of the uh, sort of like combining Southeast Alaska and Interior BC. Yeah, yeah, you really need a whole network, and um, and ideally remote sensing as a component. Of yeah, that. but there is there is, I mean that. So I guess there is quite a bit of data there that being collected, and really, what would you want to do? What could you do with that? Uh, you know, the yeah. Facilities. Well, I guess here's what I was thinking about, about when I saw your, you know, compared to South and Norway, so these systems are high, hydro systems with very limited storage mm -hmm. uh, compared to the installed capacity. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to be really sensitive to these interannual variations. And, and so, in our planning. And then I'm wondering about longer. So one way of addressing that, of course, is just to build storage. Mm -hmm. and maybe that's really expensive and not worth it, but that's one you, know, you can figure out what's, how much storage do you need to reduce that variation. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, then you've got the both sort of the longer term, like the Pacific the cable oscillation and that at that level, which is presumably what's interacting with various things in California, mm -hmm. too, then you're sort of out of luck with storage. So. I guess, you know, what are the technological options or the engineering options that you have for dealing with this variability? Right, right. And then an avalanche comes down in Juno and takes out the yeah, whole transmission okay, right. lines. You know, we have better data, we're fine. We have better yeah. data. What could we do? What are the options, the technological options that we can evaluate for their economic feasibility? Yeah. Were you going to follow up on that? I was going to follow up on that and say, it seems to me the you said, I think you asked the question, what is the value of monitoring? Mm -hmm. So you see the value of monitoring, it, it sort of depends on two things. Um, one, it depends on what is the relationship between knowing, but between the climate and the economic activity. Mm -hmm. okay, so, you know, if it doesn't do any good to know snow or rain, if rain, if they have no effect on anything, if they don't right. affect anything. But the second is relates to your ability to use that information and respond in some way if you knew it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so if you're sort of, I, I was thinking you could, in other words, if, if you have no way to respond, then it doesn't help you to know. Right, right. If you're completely capacity limited, then it may not help you to know, depending on the timing. It's when it's supply driven that makes a difference. I, I've been sort of thinking about uh, Flooding mm -hmm. is um, a problem that's related, mm -hmm. uh, although I don't know quite what the mechanisms are for floods, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's a, a, a weather thing or whether that's how ha fast it heats up, you know, mm -hmm. during some particular week. Mm -hmm. But um, on the other hand, say you knew there was going to be a flood, you can't move your home out of Galena. <laughs> right. So, right. Uh, but you could evacuate people faster and give them 48 hours warning when you know that ice is coming down the river. Yeah, you know, it seems to me that in Alaska, that, that a big a big variable is how fast um, does the uh, do the are the glaciers melting? Mm -hmm. uh, because certainly with Susitna, that's going to be a huge chunk of how much your annual flow is every year. Yeah. And it's, it seems to me the value of monitoring would be to help us understand how much you know accretion you get in the on the uh, glaciers every year. 
Yeah, so that there is a group at, at Fairbanks that studies that and has been funded by AEA to do some of the glacier work for Susitna. Um, but, you know, it's three weather stations for the whole system, you know, and they can go back and they can do, okay, we look at the satellite data, we can back out what we think is happening. But, yeah, it takes an investment to, to figure that out. And uh, I think we know even less in southeast Alaska. I'm going to get Scott back here. Then. Um, <clears throat> if I'm in charge of sitting up, I might have two questions for you. Okay. One would be, what would be the, the benefit to Susitna Hydro monitoring? And then secondly, if I build Susitna to a given configuration, how is the capacity likely to change in future years as a result of the change in increase yeah so the folks who manage um Susitna, if it's built are, are going to have challenges um not just for releasing um water to to maintain the appropriate um head in the reservoir but also for fisheries requirements too um and so you know some of the biology of when those fish need water that, you know, that's probably going to drive the timing of water release to some extent. Um, but uh, I, I think um, depending on the, the, the final design, um, you know, monitoring snow, I think could tell them quite a bit about the, um, the timing of, of the availability of water um, when it's, when it's melting. Uh, whether they need to spill because they're too full um, and they just can't store anymore in the springtime. I know in, in Sitka, that's an issue in that they, they get the water um, a little too fast and they can use it in the, the springtime is that most sensitive. Um, and so the timing of that snow melt is, is pretty important for them planning um, their, their spring spills. They want to keep as much of that water as they can because that's when they get most of their water. Um, but the reservoir can only hold so much. So I think spring is key for, for the facility managers, and that's when snow is the biggest uncertainty, I think. And that's true all over the West. Yeah. 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 That's how water comes. As you project out, 50 years ahead, do you sometimes wonder if other revolutionary technologies might just supersede all of this, whether it's tidal power or I just read about the thousand foot high wind turbine they're about to install near Fairbanks. Did you ever imagine that in your reckonings, your scientific reckonings? Well, every energy technology has its pros and cons. I think we have some nice examples in Alaska where um, hydropower has been done intelligently where it hasn't interfered with ecosystems. Um, and that's why we have in Alaska the biggest proposal for a new hydropower project in decades, 40, 50 years. Um, but uh, will there be technologies that eclipse it? Um, maybe, but I think that's, you know, obviously a major global challenge and we haven't, we haven't solved the nuclear problems. We haven't solved a lot of our, our energy, energy troubles and our demand just goes up and up. So I think hydro is going to be around for a long time. I've, I've sort of been trying to think about applications and one that occurs to me is, is um, wildfire fighting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know presumably they put a great deal of effort into predicting how dry it is in different places and how weather susceptible it is. And that's, I don't know whether there's what value, I mean, they, and so they, you know, they say the fire danger is X. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the mm -hmm. value is if you can predict that in advance. Uh, and uh, I'm just curious whether there's a lot of work going into that or. There, there is. So one of the big um, satellite products for fire weather is soil moisture. And, and you can get that okay from microwave-based satellite technology, but there's still quite a few um, sensor networks on the ground, not here in Alaska, but we just had a, 
the Alaska surveying and mapping meeting was uh, uh, two weeks ago up in Fairbanks, and there was a I took a whole class on fire um, prediction. We have uh, products coming by um, my colleague from Gina here, Jess Grumblatt, uh, um, just stepped out, but you know they have uh, monitoring for um, smoke through some of the polar orbiters. Um, so I think information for fire is really important here in the state, and uh, it's just so it's such a big, big state that I think we have to rely on the remote sensing technology for that. And then the value of it depends on how much we want to spend fighting the fire, and that depends on whose land it's burning. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Time and, and, uh, kind of thank you for a wonderful talk. And well, thanks everyone for coming. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Mike. Thank